Okay. You can hear, you guys can hear me now? All right, let's start again because this video is critically important and it is time sensitive. As you know, I have been warning you about the hundreds of trillions of dollars in contracts, the notional value of contracts that must be reset from LIBOR to SOFOR by the end of 2021. Well, officially, after the close today, they, meaning the banks, will be resetting $80 trillion worth of notional contracts over this weekend. So nobody, frankly, knows what Monday is going to look like. I'm going to show you why this is being called the Big Bang across the media. And more important, I'm going to show you what you have the power to do about it now. Now, please people, now. When the value of money shifts, everything, everything depends on how you are positioned. Coming up. I'm Lynette Zhang, Chief Market Officer here at ITM Trading. We are a full service physical, physical gold and silver company. But what we really specialize in is the strategy that I personally developed back in the 80s when I was studying currencies. This is a currency life cycle and it's unfolding, it's unfolding. I mean, I, it's hard for me to imagine that nobody can really see it clearly for what it is. But today, after the close and over this weekend, they're going to be resetting 80 trillion notional value. Now, I have to remind you, when you hear the term notional or nominal, you don't really know the true value that's at risk. That's the amount that the banks have determined that they would, that these contracts are worth. These contracts are worth. Don't want to lose anything else. Now, back in 2019, Michael Held, who is an ex executive vice president of the legal group, I have to slow down. I'm really going fast on this and I'm really getting a lot of chills. I don't like what's happening. And, and I'll tell you, before I even get into this, I was there on Black Monday in 1987. Guess what Monday is? It's the typical Monday when a crash might occur. I'm not saying that that's absolutely what's going to happen on this Monday, but I am telling you, it could. Let me show you why. So back in 2019, what we heard is a lot of concern about this transition from LIBOR to SOFR. And for those that are new to you, I'm going to give you a little uh, education on what it is. Even the Financial Stability Oversight Council has repeatedly identified reference rate transition, LIBOR to SOFR, as a financial stability risk. Mm -hmm. Because this is a big experiment. They have never done this before. LIBOR was created in the 80s. But as they say, hope is not a plan. So I'm just going to review this. I'm just going to read the whole thing and then we're going to rock and roll. It became apparent after the financial crisis that LIBOR was being manipulated. <gasps> Shocker! It's a stated rate. Banks get, few handful of banks get together and say, well, this is what I think I could borrow money for. This is what I think I would lend you money for. It's not a real rate. So the financial crisis was, LIBOR was being manipulated. Financial firms misstated their LIBOR submissions, often in collusion with each other to make better returns on their swap books. This is where they swap interest rate contracts. 
During the financial crisis, they also submitted artificially low rates to avoid signaling financial weakness. I want you to remember that one a few slides in, okay? So uh, they also submitted artificially low rates to avoid signaling financial weakness. Manipulation was possible because of the way LIBOR submissions were made. Banks were asked to estimate the rate at which they could borrow from other banks, not rates at which they actually borrowed. Woohoo! Their quotes were hypothetical, guesses, if you will, and were therefore particularly easy to compromise. Hmm, what do you think? I want you to keep that clear. And I want you to remember that because guess what happened in March? Shocker! Okay, although the actual transactions underlying LIBOR have diminished, its use as a benchmark has become ubiquitous. The gross notional value of all financial products tied to the US dollar LIBOR is around 200 trillion, 10 times the US GDP. You have links to all of these pieces on our blog. Go and read this stuff. I've been talking about LIBOR really heavily since 2012. Now, consumer loans present different issues. The documentation generally gives the lender discretion to unilaterally choose a comparable rate if LIBOR goes away. And that sounds simple, but in practice, the knot of reputational, operational, and legal considerations involved in changing the interest rate basis on consumer loans. So this is why this matters to you. I mean, it matters a lot. Um, will require attention and resources to unravel. And over 40% of LIBOR-based residential mortgage loans currently outstanding extend past 2021. So if a contract expires between now and the end of 2021, no problem. But any contracts that expire after the end of 2021 will be reset. Their valuations will change. So you're not going to have any choice about that. But a bank or, oh, I don't know, let's say that you have one of the financial products that these mortgages have been put into. Well, guess what happens to their value? They change. They either get better or they get worse, but they change. The kind of upheaval that this change would create in the global financial system and in all of these contracts will implode, could implode, may implode this system. Okay, I'm gonna keep going on. All right, so you might also remember that I talked about when they set up the Main Street Lending Program that it was really the opportunity for the Fed to push so far rates, the, the new benchmark that, that the Fed created onto the markets, but they didn't do it. Why didn't they do it? Because the banks weren't ready. The big banks were ready, but the smaller banks and medium-sized banks were not ready. And what happened? Gosh, LIBOR was largely guesswork at the height of volatility in March. Hello, it's a stated rate. This is all a game. These are all just contracts. They're not even pieces of paper. This has more value than the contracts. It just has agreements. Yeah. Oh, oh, oh. This is not working well for me this morning. I'm probably too exciting, excited. But it became, uh, so this is from that first piece in 2019. It became apparent after the financial crisis that the LIBOR was being manipulated. And guess what? It was being manipulated again. We're all being manipulated. All of us. All of these financial products. They're not real. They're not real. They're intangible. They're not real. LIBOR deadline poses huge risks 
if firms don't tweak contracts, have fallback language in them that enables them to convert to the new benchmark. But the problem still remains that the value of those contracts change with the new benchmark. And nobody really knows exactly how that's going to work out. So the banks call balk at compensation for big bang rate losses. JP Morgan, Deutsche Bank, and Nomura Holdings are among banks telling clients they won't compensate them for trades that lose value during the big bang transition, sweeping through Europe's interest rate derivative market. So they ran a test in July that was really kind of buried. I mean, did you hear much about it? Heck no, they don't want you to hear about this. Look at what's happening in the stock market today. It's up. Look at what's happening in the gold market today. It's down. Gold spot gold, which is another contract, is easily manipulated, and I can't say 100% of the time, but pretty much every single time there is some major event, you will see the spot market decline because they don't want you to know that anything scary or bad or, or that you are vulnerable to massive losses or runs, etc. They don't want you to know this. So you push down the one thing that can actually protect you using these stupid contracts. Really? Yeah, that's exactly what they do. Uh, they won't reimburse for losses. Lenders are responding to uh, an overhaul that wiped millions and millions of euros off some swaptions. Those are interest rate swap, swap options. Now look, interest rates make up the lion's share of derivative contracts. Excuse me. I'm sorry, you guys know how I get going when I see these things, because because I'm telling you, it's scaring the poopy out of me. And that's because I understand what's happening and I understand the risk. You should be scared too. I got to tell you, you should be. Over the weekend, they always do this crap over the weekend. They're going to do the bail-in over the weekend. Uh, let's see. Lenders are responding to an overhaul that wiped millions of euros off of some swaption portfolios this week and will be clo closely watched in the U.S. where banks await similar changes due in October. So they scramble to cut their derivative losses. This is today. Banks brace for big bang switch on 80 trillion worth of swaps. Now look at they've been now these are in the billions, right? The central banks, the Federal Reserve has been trying to create a market in so far and it hasn't worked. And the banks are not ready. Yeah, September, we're in October. Okay, so suddenly they started doing it. But what are you looking at? You're looking at a little bit more than 100 billion when we're looking at over 200 trillion in contracts. How smoothly do you think this could go? I don't know. Do you? Do you really think they know how this experiment is going to end? The reset, which we'll see so far, replace the effective Fed funds rate, the LIBOR, in calculations that value swaps is part of a push to make SOFR a standard U.S. reference rate in debt and derivative markets. SOFR is intended to replace the dollar LIBOR. But it still underpins hundreds of trillions of dollars of assets, such as mortgages in the U.S. and syndicated loans in Asia. Why does this matter? because the value of those contracts will change. And you, as a mortgage holder, you're not gonna have any choice about that. The language is in there, consumer debt. The language is in there for them to make that transition. How that's going to impact your payments? I can't tell you, I don't know. We'll find out though, won't we? Because what you need to know is the transition is beginning tonight.
in the U.S. It's beginning tonight. Clearing houses, and we're going to talk more about them in just a minute. Clearing houses are planning to effectively neutralize the changes in swap values. And then they mention a couple of them, LCH and CME, um, are preparing to distribute compensation from clients whose position values go up, the big banks or whoever, to those who see them decline. So they're trying to neutralize it. They ran this experiment in Europe and there were millions that were lost, but LCH will facilitate payment of hundreds of millions of dollars in cash to cover lost value and at least tens of billions of dollars in basis swaps to compensate for risk. So they're trying to neutralize it. Will it work? Maybe it will. M maybe I'm making something out of nothing. I don't think so though. This is a huge experiment inside of what we're already going through. And I'll betcha that this is part of the reason why we've seen so much QE. To the moon, to the moon. The big question is, and this is what's going to be answered over the weekend. The big question is how well the auction go. Clearing houses are not guaranteeing the minimum prices for the basis swaps, which could fall below the maximum that firms are prepared to tolerate. So moving into this, they were working together and say, okay, how much loss can you tolerate? How much loss can you tolerate? And, then, and, and that's part of the contract. So it could be different for each firm depending upon their positions. But uh, many would then likely unwind them in the open market and the price action could get very disorderly. And what he's meaning by that is we could see the stock market plunge. We could see this, I mean, the, the options market, the derivative market, it's based on the underlying stocks or bonds or real estate or weather or anything. Most of them are done over the counter. I just showed you that last week or the week before where something like 99% of them are done over the counter. There's only a small percentage, maybe this 80 trillion, that's actually go going through clearing houses. And this is how they're, they're limiting the losses, trying to keep everybody intact so this does not become an obvious financial crisis. But make no mistake, we are in financial crisis right now. And we have been, we have been since last September. The whole, not last September, this because we're in October. A year ago, when the, when, the, um, when the overnight money markets, and by the way, I'll be talking about that next week, more changes are coming on money markets. For those that think they are so safe, that's insane, they are not so safe. But, this is happening at the close of business today and the maximum loss limit is determined by the CME or any of these clearing houses at its sole and absolute discretion. Where the auction bids received by CME would result in an auction clearing price where the cost of liquidation of participant basis swaps for participants so that's these banks, would exceed the maximum loss limit as determined by CME in its absolute and sole discretion, CME will not execute the SOFR based swap auction and will take no further action. It takes place this weekend after the close starting today and over the weekend. But you have to understand that these financial systems are incestuously interconnected and they're incestuously interconnected on a global basis as well. Here are the three KCCPs, Central Clearing Parties, CME, LCH, which we've talked about, 
an ICE. And underneath them are all of your banks. Do you see any of yours in here? Because they're all interconnected. Wells Fargo, Goldman Sachs, Morgan Stanley, etc. Is there a problem? Lots of questions. Oh, lots of questions on so far? Just to simplify. Okay. So, okay. All right, let me take a breath. LIBOR is a benchmark, it's an interest rate benchmark. So when you get a contract, when you take out a mortgage or a credit card or a car loan or a student loan or any kind of loan, they tie it to a benchmark. The current benchmark since the 80s has been LIBOR. Now, because because after the crisis, everybody discovered that that was just a stated rate. They had to, the central banks had to come up with a new benchmark. In this country, there are a number of them around the world. Uh, the Bank of England has one, the Bank of, and I've done, we'll pull, uh, Dylan, make sure that you pull all of the links to the previous videos that I've done on this that will go into it more specifically. But this is, the SOFR is the one that the U.S., that the Federal Reserve came up with. And it's supposedly based upon actual transactions. But what you need to understand is that it is a new benchmark and it is calculated in a different way than the old benchmark. And that benchmark is currently embedded in hundreds of trillions of contracts, including your mortgage, your car loan, your student loan, your credit cards. And that on 80 trillion of it anyway, that is changing tonight. So it is, it is an interest rate benchmark against which contracts are pegged. They're pegged, they're tied to that interest rate. When that interest rate, so if you're like your mortgage, you took out a mortgage, it was tied to this, you have a, let's say you have a fixed rate mortgage and it just stays like that. Well, whoever holds that mortgage, that mortgage has a value, whether the bank is holding it or it's, or it's securitized, put into a financial product. It has a value. And so when you look on your screen and you open up your, your brokerage statement and it says, oh, this holding is worth X, Y, Z. Well, what I'm trying to tell you and the really important point of this is that is changing on $80 trillion worth of those contracts tonight. Now, these are derivatives, so it's not, necess it's not on your mortgages yet. That's even more complicated for them to change, but this is a big experiment that is happening tonight. And I'm going to encourage you to, we'll, we'll get those pulled up, to go back and look at all the details that I've done over time on the LIBOR and on the SOFR. But it's just a name. LIBOR is a name, SOFR is a name, the US dollar is a name. It doesn't really mean anything. What, it, what you really need to understand, it's an interest rate benchmark against which contracts are written okay, and valued. And when that benchmark changes, so do all the contracts. They have to change. And if there's not language in these contracts that enables the issuer to make those changes, I mean, there is in the credit cards, <clears throat> excuse me, the mortgages, I'm too excited. There is language. We don't really have a choice. But the derivatives market, which is much bigger, much riskier because it's all leverage, they have a choice. So they're trying to make them whole, right? So, hey, if the value of your contract goes down, we're going to give you money to offset that value decline. And that way, maybe we can hide this whole transition. But you have to understand this has never been attempted before, ever in history. Never, ever, ever. So do you know whether or not they're going to be able to make this transition? And look at this. Look at this, this chart uh, or this uh, flow chart on the screen 
where you have just a few entities that are tied into all of these banks that are tied into additional community banks, hedge funds, insurance, pension plans, central banks, sovereign wealth funds, and non-financial enterprises. It's a mess. It's potentially a huge mess. And we could wake up Monday morning, and I'm telling you, I was there on Black Monday in 1987. I went into work. I was at, at Shearson Lehman in Florida. So I went into work. It seemed like a pretty normal day to me. I get up early, so I go to lunch early. I came back from lunch. I will never forget that. It was the single best day that I could ever have had as a stockbroker. I came back and all Hades had broken loose. The phones were ringing off the hook. I mean, back then people didn't have their personal computers. So there were big screens up in two offices. There were two big rooms, right? And you walk in, there were two big rooms and two big TV screens that were showing the tickers and what was happening in the markets. And they were packed with clients. I walked in the back room where the offices were and where my office was. I'm not exaggerating. I'm telling you, I'm not exaggerating. The brokers were literally under their desks. They were not talking to, they were scared to death. They were not talking to clients. They were not taking calls. Fortunately for me, I was in it not even a year. So it didn't really have a lot of impact to me because I was working with treasury bonds and recommending gold, even though I couldn't sell it at that point. But I've been into it basically my whole life, thanks to my uncle Al. But you know, my clients were in treasury bonds and so that flight to safety, they were going up while the market was going down 25% or whatever it ended up doing that day. And I remember that's what it made my career. It made my career. I had just gone off salary on October 1st. So I was pure commission then. And I had a client that owned a savings and loan in Crockett, Texas. So if any of you guys are from Crockett or knows where it is, he owned a savings and loan in Crockett, Texas. And I had just been doing treasuries and covered calls with him. So nothing with stocks at all. But he had all of his oil friends and you know they were, they were pretty aggressive traders. It, I learned so much from these men. Honestly, I learned so much from them. And he could get me on the phone because I didn't have anybody calling up and freaking out. They were really in treasuries, not stocks. And he had me on the squawk box in the middle of his uh, conference room and all of these very active and aggressive speculative trader guys were asking me questions. And I was just pulling it up on the Quotron, that's what it was called back then, and telling them what was going on. And they all fortunately became my clients after that. So that was, a, that was a really good thing. But I'm telling you, I know what it looks like when a market implodes. I know what it smells like. I know what it tastes like. There is no place that is immune except for flight to safety. But since then, because what that was like in 86. So since then, they've even more securitized, you know, your physical metals, your treasury bond. It's all just a big casino. It's just a big intangible casino. So I kind of digress. Let me go back to this because there's something else that's also happening here. And I think that honestly, this is indicative of what we're experiencing this weekend. We're looking at silver. It closed at 2422, you know, topping out in August here at, you know, almost 30 bucks an ounce. It's severely undervalued, but I'd like you to see where it is right now. 24 bucks, 24.22. Okay. Well, let's see. The United States Mint increases prices on 15 silver products effective October 13th. We talked about this a little bit uh, the other day, but I just want you to hear some of the changes. Uh, the silver proof quarters going for 46 bucks will climb to 60 bucks. The proof Eagles 64.50 will climb to 60, 73 bucks. The 
Okay, now here we had this little discussion the other day. The Eagles, and this is from the Mint's website. Again, you've got the links. This is just a one ounce uncirculated Eagle, $67, even with spot at $24.22. What's going on here? There's a huge disconnect. You can go in to the blog. You can see all of this. You've got the links. You can pull the article. You can see it for yourself. But there is a difference between these flipping intangible contracts and the physical metal. Unlimited amounts, very limited amounts. Whether you're talking gold, you're talking silver, you're talking cups. It doesn't matter. As soon as you get physical, there are limitations. And I think that we all need to decide right now what we want to do. Now, I don't talk about this strategy and get too specific a whole lot. But for me and for the strategy that I put together, but that really, frankly, everybody at ITM has come together and made it so much better, so much more powerful. Silver is a tool of barter. So you do need silver in your portfolio. You absolutely do. But you also need gold. Because gold is the primary currency metal. Silver is the secondary currency metal. Both of them are severely undervalued. And who's buying it? The central banks are buying gold hand over fist. So as part of the strategy, there are parts. You know, we talked a lot this past couple of weeks. I've talked a lot about real estate. You need barterable gold to make sure that you can always pay your real estate taxes because it's immovable. You can't put your house on your back and go someplace else. It's immovable. This is very movable. I put this in my pocket. I can go anywhere that I want and have purchasing power wealth. That's why central banks are buying it because they know they're destroying it. So look, you got, you know, it really is time. We are out of time, people. They are executing the reset. They're executing the reset. They are executing the reset. And that's happening tonight. I've warned everybody, all the consultants at ITM, I've warned them to stand by. Because if you haven't done something, if you were thinking you might do something, get it done today. Get it locked in today while so many other people don't know what's happening. Because you know what could happen to the contracts? I mean, seriously. That's what could happen to the contracts overnight. This is what those contracts are based on. That's it. That's what that's worth. Beyond that, we got this plastic. This is all intangible. This is credit. This is debt. The biggest share of the derivatives out there are interest rate related. Well, we've got interest rates at historic lows and they've been that way for 10 years. Now you may say, oh, but can't the central banks keep doing it forever? The answer is no. The markets can certainly stay insane a lot longer than anybody would think possible, but they cannot stay insane forever. And we are coming to the end of that insanity. It could be Monday. It might not be. Hey, hey, we might wake up on Monday and the markets are doing their little things and the talking heads on CNBC and Bloomberg are, are saying their little things and no big deal. But I got to tell you, this and silver, physical metals, that's what you need to protect you because it's out of the system. All this other stuff, all this other intangible garbage, that is fully in the system. And they like it that way. Because if you wake up on Monday morning and we've got another Black Monday like we did in 87 or in 1929, 
because there are so many things that I'm seeing that happened just before the crash, especially with the naive public piling into these markets, piling into the derivative markets. It's insane. It's insane. You get to safety. Please get to safety. Please, please get to safety. I feel better because I have, but I'd feel even better because you have. I, I just don't know what else to say. I mean, the truth of the matter is, is the central bankers, who knows more about fiat, these pieces of paper, or actually really just digits in a computer screen, taken as digital. We don't even have this to protect our principal anymore. You know, they got rid of gold or they eliminated the ability of citizens to hold gold because at that point, if you did not like what politicians were doing, you went to the bank and you swapped this for this. And that meant that politicians could grow less debt if the gold was being pulled out of the system. So they took away the only tool that we individual citizens had to protect the value of our wealth. Thankfully, they gave it back to us in 86. Take advantage of it. They created those derivative contracts, spot gold, spot silver, to manipulate your perception of gold and silver, to keep you out of it while they're piling into it. I don't know how to encourage you more strongly than to say, get your gold physical, get your physical silver, do it today. Call our consultants. I, I did, I warned them before I came on this morning what I was gonna tell them about. Cause I don't know what it's gonna look like on Monday. Nobody knows what it's gonna look like on Monday. They may be compensating everybody. So, hey, no problem. Market's open. They go up 500 points. It's garbage. It's garbage. If that happens, I mean, honestly, I pray that that's what happens because there are too many people that are not prepared. And if you're one of them, get prepared. Food, water, energy, security, barterability, silver, wealth preservation, gold. It also positions you for opportunities. Community, that's what we're doing here. And shelter, you got to have a place to live and make your last stand. These things, these markets, these derivatives, these crises, they will not wait for you. You need to be ahead of them. You got a little teeny sip in March and April. How did that taste? Where were your holes? If your hole was in you didn't have enough gold or silver, get it done. And if you can still buy silver that cheap, get it done. And gold this cheap, it's correcting today. It's a joke. It's a joke. Take advantage of it. This will not last. I promise you, this will not last. I did some great videos this week, one with Chris Marcus from Arcadia Economics. If you haven't listened to that yet, I'm thinking you're gonna want to. And also with Jason Hartman on a coffee with Lynette, where we talked a lot about real estate. And, you know, looking at the rent moratoriums, the mortgage moratoriums, I mean, what happens to real estate during a reset? What happens to gold and silver during a reset? Because hyperinflation or hyperdeflation, I mean, it's the same thing. It's here. This is not something that's going to happen in the future. You need to know every single system in the, every single financial system is in jeopardy this weekend. Can they pull it off? I hope they can. 
because I know even though I have a lot, I don't have enough. I don't have enough. I want you to have enough. And next week, this will be a great conversation because I totally want to talk about this with Sean at SGT. I don't know how much he knows about it or not, but we always have great conversations and that's on Thursday. <sighs> I'm telling you, I've been getting goosebumps like crazy. I'm nervous. I'm nervous. Make no mistake about it. But for you out there, thank you for coming. Thank you for listening to this. Share this video. Do it quickly. Do it quickly. We have today. We have today. Do it quickly. We might have next week, but I don't know. And neither do you. And you guys know, I never say this kind of thing unless I'm looking at it staring me in the face. And we'll put up all those links on LIBOR and SOFR and all the other things that they've been doing to try and create this market. So you might want to go in and look at those over the weekend. But, you know, look, just call us and get, get your position in. Get it done today. Please get it done today. This could be your last opportunity to buy it this cheap. I don't know what's going to happen to the market next week, but it could be a super nasty week. Super, super nasty. As nasty as I've ever seen. And I was there on Black Monday. It is totally 100% time to cover your assets. And here at ITM Trading, we do that with the Wealth Shield, which is about sustained living, opportunity positioning, legacy building, and wealth preservation. Please get it done. And until next we meet, please be safe out there. Bye-bye.